Dang it. God. Okay, so let's talk about vertebrate evolution. And today is going to be a brief version of this. So if we... So the reason that we're doing this is partially because it follows the book that we have, and that is chapter uh, chapter four, which is entitled "Who Are the Dinosaurs?" This book is the, the chapter four. I found um, exceedingly brief. So there's actually only two pages, of which one page is taken up by a picture, and it, it didn't set the preference for where vertebrates are located within the family tree of animals. And I, the, I understand what the book is trying to do, but I think just for the, the point of the class, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build the picture up a little bit more because it, it's just so brief, it's hard to get an idea about what's going on. But vertebrate evolution is what we care about as far as this class is concerned. <coughs> understand that vertebrate evolution is a small piece of the larger tree, right, when we talk about evolution of organisms, right? It's a very small uh, portion of that. Vertebrates dominate large body sizes, that's certainly true, they've done very well in that way, but in terms of species number and abundance and distribution, uh, they don't cover as much as what we call the invertebrates, which again, it's not a real biological group because it includes members that are related to vertebrates as well, but uh, just to give you a context of how many other animals are out there, right, there's lots of other stuff. So this picture has lots of different vertebrate groups on it, some you'll recognize very clearly, some you will not. Uh, and they span the range of what we classically call the major vertebrate lineages, right? Reptiles, birds, uh, we're going to talk about dinosaurs, of course they lump in with birds, mammals, as you know, and then amphibians. And I hope by the end of the day that, you that we can at least build a better use of the word so that when we talk about amphibians, you understand that the word amphibian, as it applies to the little soft guys that you squish by in Frogger um, is not a real grouping unless you include all vertebrate lineages that have an ancestry in amphibians, right? So you are in effect a very derived group of amphibians, but for modern purposes the word amphibians means animals that live in a semi-aquatic lifestyle that have aquatic eggs, right? But that's not a real grouping for, or not a biological meaningful group for amphibians. All right, and so you're going to see this throughout the rest of this Talk. You're also going to see this throughout the rest of the semester, so you will get annoyed by it. Let me pull out my laser pointer. What you are looking at is the geological timeline as it's laid down for us, uh, and this is the standard one for around the world. You can see that it's, it's got its little, um, its little ICS and, and uh, uh, other markings at the top to denote that it's an international. Most of, again, most of the stuff that we are going to be dealing with in the course after this point will be in the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, which will deal with the Mesozoic. Again, reminding you that we, dinosaurs of course exist in the Cenozoic, but for all intents and purposes we're going to ignore them in the Cenozoic, partially to keep the class manageable, partially because there's a whole other course dedicated to them in the Cenozoic called Ornithology. But today we're going to deal with basically this period up into the Carboniferous a bit. So we're not going to talk about the Permian, and that's going to become apparent why in the future. But we are going to deal with um, the Cambrian on through the Carboniferous. And the Carboniferous is a period of, and we'll talk about this as well, but is a period of, of great uh, rainforest and, and sort of a lush tropical world, this sort of Fantasia version of the world that we have today. So why are we not spending much time um, in the Precambrian? And what would the Precambrian actually have looked like? Well, the Precambrian is uh, largely an Earth dominated by bacteria. As, as a rule. That's not to say that there aren't any groups that will uh, evolve into uh, what we think of as vertebrates, but by and large the Precambrian is a, a bacterial world, which means that uh, you've seen what a Precambrian world looks like if you've ever left uh, some sort of food out for too long, right? And especially if you leave a liquid food out for too long and it gets really cloudy and gross, if you've tasted it it's acidic. That's a Precambrian world uh, where bacterial cultures, bacterial ecosystems dominate and where uh, they will persist for long periods of time interacting with, e with each other, but you don't have a large animal or large thing coming along and eating them uh, per se. And so it's a world of uh, what some people call the biological soup, right? So there's a lot of stuff. Um, fairly, it's a very active period and we have limited fossils for a variety of reasons, but not least of which uh, because these, these things are very, very small, right? And they're also not hard bodies, hard to find lots of material from. 
So what does the Ediacaran, which is the period just before the Cambrian period, look like as far as a biological system? Uh, again, this is, this is a good reminder that a lot of the stuff in the Ediacaran fauna is dominated by bacteria, algae, protozoans, that kind of stuff. And to a much, much lesser extent, um, there's some animal communities which look very different from all other animal communities that you might recognize today, but do have some members that you would pick out, right? Um, if you've ever been in the ocean, you may have seen tinafores, which are those sort of round comb jellies. Uh, they are pretty cool because these little cilia or bands of, of hairs on the outside of the body, when they move, they diffract um, light, and that creates a rainbow pattern on their body, which is neat. Uh, and then, of course, things like jellyfish. Sponges will certainly be around. Corals, uh, some form of coral, maybe not the coral reef that you think of today, but an, a thing like a coral in that sense would be around. Uh, and then a lot of stuff that we don't know how to place. Uh, maybe an early trilobite. This is the way the artist drew it, but unclear at this point. This thing, no idea. Uh, just a giant flat thing, which may in fact just be something like a holdfast, uh, and, and the, the actual portion of the animal or thing may be sitting up above here. Right. Very hard to know. Uh, it's just a flattened shape. Things like this, no idea. Right. Really very unclear what that might be. Uh, some people have argued that the actual, the diversity of life, there was a major extinction event at the end of the Ediacaran, and that gave rise to all modern groups, that there was a, a giant uh, void left uh, when these groups went extinct, just because they are so different from the way that modern animals are built. And so, uh, again, this is a very different looking uh, flora and fauna than you would be used to. This is one, if you go and actually look at a model, sometimes they remake, they, they make these into full 3D things and add some color to it. Color, again, is uh, hypothetical. For jellyfish, almost certainly, you're right. It's probably clear. For things like this, which look like sea pens, uh, debatable, right? Really have no idea what's going on there. Maybe they have things like corals. Maybe they're green. Maybe they're clear. It doesn't. It's not entirely clear. Here is maybe that little primitive trilobite down there. Again, no, no real. Uh, that's probably a primitive trilobite is what we've been told. Here's that weird flat thing. So uh, a weird flat thing related to other weird flat things um, <laughs> in some context. Again, very difficult to place. This is all we have from that, right? Very hard to know what's going on here. OK, so that is the Precambrian world, this world of weird stuff. Yeah, what's your question? Is there any evidence that there was a mass extinction event? Or are we just saying because there was? The evidence for the mass extinction event, if there was one, is that the animals that are alive prior to the Precambrian event and animals that are alive after are very, very distinctly different in body type. So they, they appear to evolve, they have very different body types. So the prior body type is built from a fractal system where you build out and make a miniature version of that, then build out and make a miniature version of that. And so as you get smaller and smaller in the animal, it looks like the same thing, just in a, in a pattern, right? So that's a fractal. Modern groups are very different, right? You're bilaterally symmetrical or in some groups radially symmetrical and the pattern is not contained as you go down. If you show me your hand, your hand is not bilaterally symmetrical in any way. And that's a characteristic of a different group of animals that appears to have arisen after that. Why that, now that could just be the fact that these, this group appeared at the same time and it's related to this other group. Some people have actually argued that they're separate groups that they evolved independently and that the Edicarian fauna largely went extinct in sort of a, a failed attempt um, against these, these newer bilaterals, right? That there's this, this interplay. It's very, as you get into these, as you get to these ages, very difficult to know what's going on. You're dealing with very few numbers of specimens and very, very limited amounts of time. They're just, it's like someone took a Polaroid picture um, once in a million year time span and then ripped it up and gave you a piece of it and told you, uh, okay, tell me what just happened. It's like, uh, I, don't, I, I just don't have the, 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 the strength to tell you with that amount of information. So uh, anyway, to, to answer your question, uh, the fossils change, which is hard to say that there's a lot of evidence in that case. Um, so we, th that's going to deal with this period right here. Uh, so you're dealing at about 600 million years ago. So we're still out quite a bit from today, right? We're, we could still measure things on the order of billions of years, quite a bit of time. Uh, the Precambrian is going to occur right down here at about, for, all, for our purposes, it would occur at about 540 million years ago. That's called the uh, Cambrian Explosion. And the Cambrian Explosion, which is right where this arrow is located, is a period of time at which 
uh, the animal life that you think of today really appears on the surface of the Earth. It, it fills the niches available, and it does so very, very rapidly on the order of just a few million years. Now, keep in mind, uh, that sounds relatively slow. A couple million years sounds slow, but keep in mind that we've had more than three billion years prior to this, right? So it's slow. There's been three billion years, and now all of a sudden in two million years, boom, animals, everything, that, things that you would recognize, right? And as far as we can tell, all the major groups um, have their have their descendants appear right at this line. That if you have a major group alive today in your hand, it belongs right here, uh, by and large, uh, is, is where it radiates from uh, other groups. Now that, that is slightly untrue in a sense. So again, all, all major animal groups appear in, the, in a geological blink, and that's where the explosion cart, the part comes from. Uh, the question that you would love to know is why, <laughs> right? That's a big question for us. Uh, and then uh, the most recent evidence for why it might have occurred uh, actually deals with oxygenation. So it seems like food chains were very, very, very short in the, in the pea soup of the bacterial world. As the oxygens became more and more oxygenated, and as the oxygen penetrated actually into the deep waters of the ocean, right, which are the majority of the ocean, when you talk about the edges of the ocean, the coastal zone, you're talking about less than 1%. Well, once oxygen finally penetrated into the deep waters of the ocean, that allowed uh, food chains to extend. And as food chains extended, you have this explosion of, of arms races where different groups are radiating to try to beat other groups at different things. And you get things like jaws appearing, uh, not in vertebrate groups, but in other lineages. Uh, and you get the evolution of very complex structures to try to accommodate uh, uh, capture or try to accommodate escape from those animals, right? And so uh, that's, that's probably what's going on. So the Cambrian explosion is probably what we call a morphological explosion or a morphological change in that the body shapes are changing. We know very well now that the genealogical changes, so the genes themselves, so the, the separators, the things that separate these groups, were established before that. So prior to the Cambrian explosion, the, the lineage that would give rise to vertebrates had already separated from things like, that you would think of like sea stars. Right? So they are separate lineages at that point, but they don't look very distinct. If you look at animal groups from prior to the Cambrian explosion, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot look like very simple un, uh, uh, worms is the best way to describe them. Small, flattened, worm-like things. Uh, and that's probably not surprising. How do we know that there wasn't just a rapid evolution of genes as well? So this comes down to, to clocks, right? And how so it, it one you could argue that instead what may have happened is uh, genes rapidly evolved at this period. That may be true. All of the evidence seems to point, depending on which clocks you put, that the genes evolved well before that break. So if that were the case, we would expect some genes, highly, highly conserved genes, to appear and radiate at that point. So you'd expect clocks to estimate about 540 million years. And most clocks are on the order of six to 700 million years. So they seem to be well behind that. So groups seem to have separated well before that period. So that what was really happening there is, is at that Cambrian explosion event, we have um, something like a champagne bottle where all these things are building up, right? But the food chains are very, very short. There isn't a lot of opportunity for diversity. The, the top of that blows out, and then you have ex an explosion of diversity because you have all the foundation laid out for that possibility. So the Cambrian world is a very different world. Uh, you have a lot of things swimming around in the, in the waters above you. This is actually uh, this is an animal called Anomalocaris, which is related to probably brine shrimp. So you can think of this as a giant predatory brine shrimp. And by giant, I mean one to two meters long. Um, these are... Uh, these were sort of the top predators of the ocean at the time. You have, uh, this is the sort of the heyday of the trilobite. You've got trilobites everywhere. You've got lots of other things. This group is actually now entirely terrestrial. All of their marine descendants went extinct. Um, you've got weird worm-like things that are sort of related to us at some level. Uh, and then you have uh, more arthropods. All of these are arthropods, right? These are all hard-bodied animals uh, in general. And you've got weird swimming ones, uh, maybe with giant blue eyes, which look pretty cool. I don't know that they had giant blue eyes, but I like them. Um, <laughs> but these are swimming around in the water above them, right? Question? No? Question? Wait, the weird spiky worms, you said they only have terrestrial descendants? Right. So what are they? These are velvet worms. So this is Hallucigenia. Um, this is a velvet worm with spikes on its back to protect itself. Uh, these legs are fairly long, but if you look at modern velvet worms, they also have very long legs. They are somewhat related to insects at a level. Uh, another, arthro another group, 
related to the arthropods and uh, they no longer use these spikes and they've evolved a cool capture mechanism where they spit out really sticky glue and, and then eat the item. But that's all terrestrial derived. They were originally marine animals. Uh, they appear not to have done particularly well um, and have lost out. And in modern day lineages, they are also uh, fairly, they, they're just getting by, right? They're not very, they're speciose in a small amount, uh, but they, they have relatively uh, small populations and they don't take up huge amounts of ecological space in that way. Uh, how would you classify the uh, major predator? Are there any like, characteristics? Yeah, so that? this is hard. It depends on who you talk to right now. So, uh, and it also, it really depends on what this is called, which is called the great appendage. Uh, there are two of them. There's one here and one here. If it is as, uh, if it is where, where some people argue, it's actually fairly closely related to all modern crustacean lineages. Uh, if that is incorrect, then it may be a far distant relative that looks something like them. So does that so something like a crustacean is probably where the best place to put it. Again, when you get back into these deep, deep times, it's very hard to know what's going on. Do we have any evidence of tardigrades? Yeah, so tardigrades are absolutely around by this time, um, and they are that's actually tardigrades are somewhat related to these guys. Mm -hmm. It turns out tardigrades are a miniaturized version of an a pre arthropod lineage. So they are a lineage that contain a lot of arthropod characteristics, and the difference is. Uh, they've evolved to fill very, very small spaces, and uh, that has caused them to lose some of the characteristics. But they were certainly around at this time. They may have even been taking up some of the same niches that they do today, which is that sort of ephemeral, uh, highly spotty environment uh, where they, they appear, eat, and then they, they go into stasis again. So yes, absolutely tardigrades are alive at this point as a group. So like I said, there's quite a bit of debate about how this actually went on. Um, life was well diversified prior to the Cambrian explosion. That's absolutely the case. We know that. Uh, but why that may have happened, it, it's unclear. The best evidence I've had, uh, or the best, the best argument I've seen is this one about food chains, which was relatively recently published, which is that you needed long food chains to get uh, morphological diversity, right? You really needed to see very long food chains so that you could have these ridiculous trophic structures with animals interacting, all sorts of animals interacting and causing huge amounts of pressure on different pieces of the body. And that uh, may have been enough to cause this diversification. And the, rate, the reason for that would have been this oxygenation. So oxygen has been building up for a long, long time um, prior to this event because it's a waste product, right? Oxygen is, in, is in fact, very dangerous to most life and, in fact, dangerous to you. Um, but it, you, you have mechanisms to deal with it. Uh, and prior to this, most organisms did not. And so uh, that may have also partially driven that extinction event at the end, that organisms may not have been able to deal with these higher oxygen events. So you will remember that I showed you no vertebrates there, right? These are all arthropod-like things that are related to the arthropods in some way. Uh, that's because vertebrates, if we were to show them, would be little tiny dots uh, on the, that, that ocean. And they would have looked a lot like this thing, uh, which is a, a, an ancestor of a vertebrate tree. So these belong to our vertebrate lineage, and they look, uh, I guess, generously like a fish. Uh, but in, in principle, they look a lot like a, a piece of tissue that swims around, right? This is vertebrates probably evolved from a group of animals uh, that spent more and more time in the larval stage. And so early vertebrates are going to be dominated by these very tiny things that spend a lot of time in the plankton, and they are uh, filter feeders. Uh, and that, that's absolutely the case. We know that uh, all modern groups that are related to vertebrates that aren't quite vertebrates, right, uh, belong to filter feeding groups. Uh, and these guys are basically living that life out now, not on the bottom of the ocean, but in the ocean water itself. So uh, you can thank this little guy. He carries actually all the characteristics that make you a vertebrate. This guy also has, um, ex except for the vertebrae. And he doesn't have paired fins yet, right? Just a one single fin around the body. If you're very small, you don't really need paired fins. Um, and if you're plankton, you definitely don't need to be too worried about swimming lots of the time. You just want to control where you are in the water column. Okay, so where does where are we? We're back here. Remember, this is a Cambrian explosion, which I'm going to abbreviate CE. That's where that little tiny vertebrate like dot appears, right? Uh, well, after the Cambrian explosion, so we've had quite a few million years to evolve. And vertebrates at this point are things that will become vertebrates, are uh, little tiny soft bodied animals that swim in the plankton and are filter fed on by everything else, right? These are pretty low on the food chain. They're probably eating algae and maybe very small zooplankton.
but uh, we actually do have a group of jawless vertebrates, which remember at this point we have, these are filter feeders, they haven't evolved jaws, they're just tubes inside of a tube without any mechanism to control their, the one tube's opening. Um, we do have some modern, modern uh, jawless vertebrates, there aren't that many, this is actually one of the groups uh, that I spend my time on. I deal with these guys, uh, these guys are much harder to get, these are hagfish, they're at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, they are uh, fairly abundant, probably one of the highest biomasses of animals at the bottom of the ocean, but uh, you need a relatively deep uh, water survey uh, method to go down and get them. These guys, on the other hand, lampreys are relatively common in temperate streams, and we can go out and collect some. We could today if we wanted to go out and collect some lampreys if we really needed them. In any case, all of these animals have long cylindrical bodies, so they're bodies that tend to be relatively long. These animals are much, much larger. They're probably in the order of, uh, at least modern groups, in the order of a man's arm uh, at the, probably the larger size, and then go down to maybe the size of a finger. Uh, that's probably not true of ancient groups. Probably ancient groups are more on the size of smaller or about the size of something that could easily fit in your hand. So the, the large body size has evolved later. They do have a very distinct head, right? They've got things like eyes. Uh, they've got a notochord. They probably evolved vertebrae at some point and then lost them. Uh, and these animals are not filter feeders, okay? So even at this point in vertebrate evolution, uh, and these animals are starting to experiment with other things. These guys are eating carrion. Sometimes they're catching live animals. These guys are attaching onto host animals and feeding off their blood. So they are still uh, primarily get waiting for organic matter to come to them and be partially liquefied or, or uh, digested by the host, um, but then they are actively uh, uh, pulling that material out. And uh, hagfish, also very cool. A lot of invertebrates do this as well, but hagfish can eat through their skin. They don't need to feed through their jaws. Their skin will pick up food out of the water column. These are, and at the bottom I have, are these in fact a group? Yes, modern cyclostomata, which there's some debate about this for a number of years prior, uh, are probably unified now into a true group. So these guys have a common ancestor and they are distinctly different from the rest of the vertebrate tree because they branched off so much earlier. So probably divergence at maybe a 500 million years ago. Again, this is about, we're starting to talk about uh, after the Cambrian explosion, the diversity of the sea, the sea life is changing and animals like this are starting to appear. Okay, so those guys are going to appear probably somewhere in here, right? So they're still uh, within the Cambrian, but we're starting to see some diversification. At the same, at about the same time, we have these very cool armored-like fish, and armor is very important for us in any case because we're evolving things like bone, right? And this, uh, this evolution of bone is occurring. Probably a filter feeder again. Uh, unclear about these guys. They're, they're very, very heavy animals in any case. So they, if they are filter feeders, they're hanging out a lot at the bottom. And they may, in fact, be related, what we would call a sister group, so the, the, the uh, most closely related group to our own lineage, which we call the naphostomes, which would be the jawed animals. You can see that these animals look a lot like what we think about modern fish in some ways, but they're also doing things that are a little bit different, and they're trying really hard to look like modern fish, but they don't have the adaptations. Uh, they don't have paired fins, but you can see that some of them extend the edges of the head to make something like a paired fin. They don't have the individual dorsal fin that modern fish would have, but they maybe put spikes there. They've moved the eyes very close to the front of the animal. They're probably not that good at seeing things, though. Uh, and they've really restricted the, the propulsion of the animal to the tail. So they've moved, they've really, they're starting to separate out what different parts of the body are good for. And it's no longer that the whole body needs to move. Uh, now you just really want the tail mobile while you keep the head static, right? So there's some evolution in these groups as well. Here's some of that diversity. These are all probably related to each other. Again, we have a spotty record, so it's unclear. Probably they do a lot of stuff like this. This looks like a mouth. It's just a, it's just a hole. It can't close. It can't bite down. So those guys are probably appearing in uh, somewhere in here. So we've advanced to 470 million years ago. So we've now spent 70 million years advancing through time, which means we've spent longer than the period that we did from the end of the, the, end of the Cretaceous tertiary boundary to now. And we have um, some jawless fish that are fairly low on the food chain uh, with maybe some bones, right? That's what we've got. Uh, that's pretty good. But you can uh, sort of the length of time these things take to acquire, right? These are enormous periods of time. So now we're going to deal with this period in here. Uh, and this is going to be a more active period as we're concerned. We get things now. These are the astraci, the astracoderms. Um, they're going to pick up a lot of modern fish characteristics. They're getting paired fins now. Uh, so that they have the, the, the things that make your arms right have now evolved. That would also probably include the, that they probably have 
uh, in their ancestry, paired um, pelvic fins maybe as well. They have uh, relatively sophisticated uh, brains, so their brain structure is very similar to our own. They're not smart, but it's relatively sophisticated. Uh, they've moved, again, they've made the tail the dominant mode of propulsion, and the body is starting to lose that armor in favor of things like uh, just scales. Or it's not scales yet, but things like scales. Okay, so these animals are also increasing in size, right? We're getting animals up to a meter in size now. Uh, and they are uh, not the dominant form of life, uh, absolutely, but they are uh, at least a component of many ecosystems, and they seem to be relatively common uh, in those places. This group in particular, uh, which has this very distinctive head shield, and also these little pinkish purplish areas are actually a, probably electrosensitive organs uh, that you might see on sharks. That's probably already evolved at this point. The, one of the, the early uh, finders of this uh, animal, this is back in, I believe, the 1800s, he, when he found this fossil, he sanded down uh, micrometer by micrometer and then sketched uh, at what he saw as he went through. So he dissected an animal that had been preserved 400 million years ago with sandpaper, and his uh, records of uh, the brain are actually so good that you can follow individual nerves back into their location within the brain. So uh, that's very, very cool. It turned, the fossil, of course, ended up as a pile of sand, which is too bad for the fossil, but we learned a lot from it, right? So destruction of fossils is sometimes necessary in that case. And as a result, these, uh, these organs appear to intersect the brain probably in the same places that electrosensitive organs would uh, in modern groups. And so there's some indication that they're electrosensitive organs. And that might make sense for an animal that's cruising along the bottom looking for worms. Um, Osteo, so do, have they formed bones? Yes, yeah, so these are truly bony animals now. So this head shield, these, these scale-like things, that's real bone. Oh. Um, so if you were to dissect these animals, you would find vertebrate. So these are real vertebrates at this point. This is a real vertebrate uh, ancestry. And so they, they have uh, things like uh, bones within them. The, why bones evolved is another question. My question, wasn't there a uh, genre of uh, genus down there? Uh, uh, armored fish that reached a few meters in length? Uh, armored fish that reached a few meters in length? Yes, so we, these, are, these are a group of armored fish. These are jawless armored fish. The, uh, probably the group you're thinking of are the armored fishes that are jawed, which we call the placoderms. We will get to those, and absolutely did, they did reach many meters in length, uh, and they become the top predator uh, when they do evolve, and those were relatively close to that divergence point. Okay, so we're, we're back here again. Uh, vertebrate life is, again, completely restricted to marine environment still, maybe entry into fresh water. Uh, that, that's possible, and maybe it occurred even earlier, but in any case, uh, we're, we're still restricted entirely to some form of water. Animals are never leaving the water, unless it's because a stream dried out and they're dying on the side of the bank. Should be too bad, but. So we're gonna advance a little bit further now. We're gonna come up here, and this group I think you will recognize when you see it. So we look at the phylogeny of fishes. We haven't talked about these, uh, these uh, placoderms yet, but we just mentioned them briefly. Uh, and this is the group of, of nathostomes. So these are the animals with jaws. These are animals like yourself, right? You're a nathostome. You belong to this group. You belong to a specific branch in this group, and we're going we're gonna to find out which branch it is, but you belong within this group. Now, some of the group members you'll know very easily. Chondrichthys is the sharks, right? So we know that. One thing I do want you to note here is you can see at the bottom that all of these lines appear to intersect. So there's a group Placoderms, there's a group Chondrichthys, and then there's this other group called Ophthyichthys, which we will define, but they all intersect at the same point. That means we don't know which group diverged first from the other. This is what we call a comb structure. You will see it in phylogenies when we don't have enough information. And that would suggest to you that these will move uh, in the future because they have to as we gain more information about that. Comb structures are the default we don't know in phylogenies. It's what happens when you have limited support for a tree. These other branches you can see are well supported. They're separate from each other. And you don't have combs. But when you get down to the bottom here, as you go back in time, of course, combs are more likely to appear. And if you have really bad phylogenies, you may, say, you may see combs of tens or 20 or more species in a single area. And that means we have very, very limited understanding about when these species diverged. Uh, in some cases, you might see individuals. So if we go, again, if we draw a phylogeny of individuals, you may see a comb. And that may, in fact, be a real thing. Uh, to some degree if all the individuals appear at the same time uh, within that. But for us anyway, at the species and genus level or even higher, uh, you do not want to see combs, right? That should not be the case. 
So where do we get jaws from? I just mentioned that we I've introduced nathostomes. So nathostomes have uh, we uh, have evolved. Um, and so where are we actually getting, how we actually get to this jaw? Well, what we start with is a jawless animal that has a, a body and a head with a bunch of um, skeletal rods that support gills. This is not particularly uncommon in our, in the ancestors of all vertebrate lineages. It's cartilage, which supports that, and it doesn't move very much, but it does move to some degree. And it can be, it opens and closes simply by one muscle pulling the cartilage down. And then when the muscle releases, the cartilage wants to spring open and it forces the head back open again. That works really well when you're small. As you get larger and larger and larger, you need much, much, much more cartilage until the point where the whole head would have to be cartilage for you to get that springing action. And so with the evolution of things like bones, you can actually start to pull on things in different ways. So this is involved. Um, from the evolution of multiple bones and muscles, right? So this takes a long time to appear. And probably what had happened is that these arches that made up the gills were pushed forward um, into the head. And as they did that, uh, they tended to form uh, more and more of a, of a device that could be partially opened and closed until you reach some point where there's a real mechanism to attach it, multiple uh, jaws and, and articulations, and that jaw can really be used to do things like bite, right? Um, here's an animal without a jaw, right? So the, the gills are, gill arches are all lined up like that. Here's an animal with a jaw, and probably it's a gill arch that bends forward uh, and forms that. And the reason that, you, that we think that might be the case is, if this is the case, right, if we, if we have this happening, one, uh, jaws should be developed from the same uh, structures within the embryo that gills are. Good news, they are. Um, and two, you should also see this opening, which is a gill opening. It should get pushed up and away because there won't be any room for it down here, and so it should end up on top of the head. Good news, we do find that in primitive groups, that we find it up and above the head. And in fact, sometimes humans are even born uh, with what we call a spiracle, which is that gill opening, uh, and it would extend into your inner ear canal. As sharks retain it throughout their entire lives, and the fishes that you might go out and catch in a stream, uh, some groups do in fact have spiracles. Okay, so what are the benefits that you might have from a partial jaw? What, are, what would possibly be a benefit? Okay, so the first group of nathostomes are these, which are called the placoderms. These are the armored fish, I think, that you traditionally think of. They have enormously armored heads, like you've seen in all the other groups. They've given up um, most of the body protection. Uh, they, they now have very small scale-like things, uh, which are called placoderm scales, which are a scale type um, and are probably the same structures that make teeth. Uh, it's probably teeth are evolved from placoderm scales that have folded in over the mouth. Uh, as the anim as uh, uh, these groups diverged, um, and they have cool things like they have these giant gaps in their head so they can swivel the head uh, forward, pitch it up and down, um, and they have uh, the paired pelvic fins, right? So the legs that you have today have now by now evolved, right? And the uh, paired pectoral fins that we have today, um, our arms have also evolved, right? These, I, I wrote apparently extinct because it used to be that we'd say placoderms are extinct; they have no modern relatives. Uh, modern phylogeny suggests that all other groups are a small outbranch of, placo of a group of placoderms that appeared on the surface of the earth, and therefore all groups then are some form of placoderm. They are just a very, very modified version of that placoderm, and that's because they appear to share characteristics with us uh, that other groups uh, do as well, and that seems to be very specific to the placoderm. So they may in fact uh, not be extinct. You may be a living placoderm, although albeit a highly modified one. Again, this is that hierarchical structure. If you evolve as a placoderm, right, it's not like one day you become a goldfish and if you're, you are in fact still a placoderm, you're not a placoderm anymore. It's <laughs> that you've stepped into a different group of placoderms. You're now a very different form of placoderm, but you would still be a placoderm in that sense. Placoderms also have internal fertilization. This is, uh, I just like this one because the artist drew these placoderms lying down like they have a little bed or something. Um, males do have, this is not a penis, this is called a clasper, uh, which sharks also have. They're separate, so the, the evolution of the penis occurs multiple times and separately, um, but the clasper does exactly the same thing. It allows internal fertilization. So internal fertilization within the group of the fishes is very, very old. This has been going on for a long time. Whether they retain the eggs within their body is different. Um, this is actually how sharks go about doing it. Here's a clasper. It can actually bend. So unlike the, the artist couldn't show you the clasper bending. Claspers have a lot of cartilage, and they also have a joint. So
So shark males, don't be a shark female, is what this is what this is telling you. Shark females get bitten, and then eventually the male locks onto her, so he usually bites her uh, and holds onto one of her pectoral fins. And at that point, he can twist around over her back and use the clasper um, to uh, inseminate her. The, the issue, of course, is uh, sometimes females die because sharks have really nice bitey teeth, and uh, that can cause blood loss. So uh, females can get bitten up and actually die if there's too many males around. And here's just a picture of those. This again, claspers appear to be an old trait. Um, this is a this is a male shark, and here's a female, right? So there's the clasper itself, and that's in its normal form when it's not bent forward. Okay, so we're right around here. We're at about 420, 430 million years ago. So at this point, there's a lot of really cool stuff that's happened. We we have the evolution of jaws. We've got lots of bones. We've got internal fertilization, right? That seems like a pretty cool thing. We've got the modern brain structure has evolved. Um, we've got these really advanced fishes that are now getting really big, like on the orders of 10 meters. Like these are big animals, and they're also taking large body niches. So they're now the arthropods are by and large not capable of taking over these large body niches. A couple caveats about this, though, of course, is that we're still marine, right? We're still within the marine realm. Okay, so let's move forward. So what have we added to these fish? Well, we've got things like osmoregulation. I went through a couple other things. We've got highly sophisticated muscle control, right? We've got a lot of muscles, and we're really good at using only certain ones. We probably have very, very good eyesight. Uh, armor, which is bone, right? These have evolved. Um, the internal organs that you have today, kidneys, uh, uh, stomach, uh, gonads, uh, the heart, uh, not the lungs yet, uh, but those other structures have evolved at this point, livers, gallbladders, all that stuff. So if you dissected a shark, you would be very comfortable with this internal anatomy if you knew humans. We've got lots of fins. We have very, very well-developed gills. Probably some form of suction feeding, although big heads like this are hard to manipulate to do lots of suction feeding. And we have this cool thing called internal fertilization, which we will gain and lose in evolutionary time. And what, what don't we have yet uh, within the group? So what, what things have we not acquired yet? Okay, so at this point, uh, we also now gain a group called the Acanthodians, which are sometimes called the spiny sharks. I just kept this quote in here. It talks about that they, uh, their similarities to sharks are largely superficial. So be very careful when you publish in science. This was literally uh, 17 years ago. This appears to be entirely incorrect. Uh, they are not largely superficial. Sharks are probably derived Acanthodians, which are, again, probably derived placoderms. Uh, so we need to be a little careful about these all or none statements. Uh, and they are a group that's probably what we call paraphyletic. So the paraphyletic grouping means what? It's. Go ahead. What did you think it was? So it's. They are not unified. They are somewhat. They're probably related at some level, but their last common ancestor is not included within them. So it's like taking part of your family tree out. They are related to some degree, but it wouldn't include, let's say I want to take a family tree, everyone but your parents. Okay, well that doesn't make any sense, right? That's not a family tree then. That's just a weird bunch of lines without some sort of node somewhere. Um, so these guys are probably multiple groups of animals that are uh, related to one another. Okay, so let's talk about the Devonian because the Devonian is interesting to us. Uh, up until this point, if you went to a terrestrial surface, even though there aren't vertebrates out there, there's a good reason. It's because it's rock. Uh, there's you, there are not going to be soil. There's not really going to be trees. Um, you're not going to really have lots of animals away from the tide line. The tide line, you're going to have algae growing on the shoreline. You're going to have some animals creeping around. Maybe trilobites are coming in and out of the water. Uh, maybe animals are using the beach to some degree. But other than that few meters interacting with the water, there's not much, not much else. You could walk for years on the land and never see anything but a big rock, right? So it's a very different world. But in the Devonian, we have uh, some cool stuff going on, not least of which is the land is finally being invaded by plants. And you should start to recognize animals like this, right? These are what we think of traditionally as fishes. Uh, and these belong to the group Osteichthys. Osteichthys are bony fishes. Uh, assuming sharks never had bones, which appears to be incorrect now, uh, Osteichthys is a group. So Osteichthys should now include, to be a, a truly monophyletic group, should include things like the sharks, if we were going to refer to modern groups. These guys have, uh, we don't have to worry about this too much, but they have three pairs of odalisks, so they have really good balance and control. 
uh, other groups do not. And they include two major lineages. We have the Sarcopterygii, which are the lobe fin fish. Uh, you belong to a Sarcopterygii. And then we have the Actinopterygii, which are the ray fin fish, which are these guys, which is if you've ever gone out fishing or you've looked at fish in general, this is the animal you're looking at, the ray fins. Interestingly, both of these groups are actually wildly successful. So as far as vertebrates are concerned, these are the most the successful vertebrate groups we've ever had. Uh, but they're exclusive almost to one environment. So Sarcopterygii are exclusive to the terrestrial environment. They seem to be almost exclusively to the terrestrial environment. And Actinopterygii appear to be almost exclusively to the marine environment. There are some exceptions to those rules, but you're talking on the order of a, hand, a literal handful of species in both cases. Uh, and the members do not extend into their uh, into the other's world very extensively. Coelacanth are exceedingly rare, exceedingly rare. Um, estimates of their populations put them at well under maybe a thousand individuals in some locations. So you're talking about very small numbers of these guys. Sarcopterygians, which is what we care about because this is a group, uh, this is our group, right? They have lobe fins, they have these distinctive lobe fins which are now bones within the fins and they've got very stiff uh, arms and legs as a result. They're not arms and legs yet, but they, they function in the same way. It turns out the motion of uh, quadrupeds, which is the uh, alternating arm, so if, if my right arm is extended, my left leg is extended, and vice versa. If my left arm is extended, my right leg is also extended. Uh, that, that motion is already set in coelacanths. Coelacanths use the quadrupedal motion when they're moving. Uh, they're not actually touching the ground, but they, they circulate water around themselves in that same motion. Probably appearing at about 400 million years ago, uh, but the, the group as a whole that we're concerned about is when they really start to enter into uh, near terrestrial environments. So they're entering into things like swamps. And these are uh, relatively thick bodied animals, uh, they're pretty robust, and we do have some modern groups left in the, in the in aquatic worlds, but not terribly many of them. Okay, so they're probably appearing right here, uh, right around the Devonian, and they enter into and they live in environments like this one. So here's a very good example of a lobe fin fish. Uh, and it's probably living, this is, a, this is a very derived lobe fin fish. We haven't gotten to them yet. Probably living in environments like this where there's lots of submerged trees and aquatic vegetation and water levels uh, are fluctuating and also you have uh, limited oxygen, right? And at certain times of the year as water levels go up and down. And it's at this point that the lungs evolve, right? So lungs have now evolved and they are probably facilitating their living in these very variable environments where DO might be able to drop down and animals would suffocate without them. This is one of the more famous ones. This is Euthanopteron. This is probably one of the most well-known ancient fossil fishes ever discovered. We have hundreds and hundreds of these specimens. It doesn't look a lot like a modern group, but it is actually very closely related. Uh, they have internal nostrils, right? You have internal nostrils. They have folded enamel on teeth, like early tetrapods. Um, they have this very characteristic group of bones, the humerus, the ulna, and the radius. They also have femur, tibia, and fibula, right? So they're lobe fins in the very real sense of the word. It turns out their long bones, which are these bones, right, grow the same way as ours do. So they grow out. And they also have bone marrow, which means that that is probably also set by this point in evolutionary time. So again, this group, uh, it doesn't look a lot on the surface like a, lobe, like a, like a uh, modern lineage, but it, it's, it contains many of the pieces that we have today. Right? Not a coincidence in that way. So that's in the Devonian. Um, we're now going to talk about a, a lobe fin fish that continues that pattern. So we've seen things like the reduction of uh, uh, the, the size of these fins. They used to cover the entire body. And we're also seeing those lobe fins become stiffer and stiffer. Here's a very good example of that. This is very clearly something like a modern amphibian, right? You've now reduced all of the fins down to these two groups, these two paired fins, and then one very stiff caudal fin, right? That, or a very large caudal fin. It's not stiff, it's mobile. You've also done some other weird stuff. You've moved the eyes on top of the head uh, like a crocodile, right? So this animal's probably right at the water's interface. You probably, you have much, much longer limbs. Look at the length of these limbs relative to modern uh, groups that you might think about. And you have a lot of strength possible on these limbs, right? As these bones have gotten thicker and longer. So you have very, very strong bones. Some weird problems for these guys. Uh, one, the fins come out from the lateral side of the body, not from underneath it where you want them, because if you're on land, you want to put the, the weight directly down on top of them. If they come out from the lateral side, that's going to provide some issues, and you'll see that as we go through modern terrestrial groups, or uh, uh, primitive terrestrial groups, that they have some serious issues with load bearing because of that. 
They've also got some other weird things like a lot of vertebrae, like a lot of vertebrae, way more than you have. Uh, and they, they are clearly uh, still entirely aquatic because they, are, they only have gills. And they do have lungs, but they're not able to use to live out of the water without those gills. Uh, it's probably the most likely thing. All right, and we're not going to belabor this by going through each one of these individually. I just want to give you an idea of where we came from. Here's your synopteron with these very distinct lobes. We start to reduce the number of fins and push the, the lobes into these very large bodied, um, or, uh, 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 extended from the body. We get into these very uh, classically middle ground amphibian fish thing, which may be related to modern amphibians and may be more distantly related to them. And at some point, we eventually evolve um, a true fishopod, which is an animal that is probably primarily aquatic, but can occasionally and does occasionally venture onto land. And this is the point at which we are concerned because we really want to deal with these groups, right? The specific group of lobe fin fish that spend a lot of time on land. These guys still are very aquatic in their lifestyle, uh, but at least for part of the time, they spend something on land. So where does that locate us? Well, okay, so we, we haven't even made it out of the Paleozoic yet, but we're really high up in the Devonian period, really close. So there, there's not a lot of stuff in the terrestrial environment, again, but we are, if you walked around at the end of the Devonian, you might recognize some things. There's probably something like, there's primitive forests around. Um, the land has got some coverage on it. There's things like soil now, there's fungus. Um, there are probably there are lots of insects crawling around. A lot of groups you wouldn't recognize, but some groups you would. And if you're near to water, to streams and whatnot, you probably see fairly large amphibians, uh, or what you think were amphibians, what you would call amphibians. So uh, what happens at the end of the Devonian? Well, there's a large extinction event. It, I say event here, um, but pro it's probably multiple events uh, that go on. Um, and this appears to just destroy marine diversity. It all but eliminates uh, large chunks of marine diversity. Uh, trilobites, it turns out at every extinction event, tri it's like you could list animals that get devastated by it. Trilobites is like always top of the list until they finally go extinct. Every mass extinction event, trilobites get nailed. Uh, and this is not an exception to that rule. Trilobites get nailed at this extinction event. Jawed vertebrates more or less appear to make it through with little effect. It's not entirely clear why that's the case. Uh, and what is what it maybe will happen in the future and what, what happened at the Devonian? Coral reefs are gone. Uh, as far as we can tell, coral reefs no longer exist in the ocean. They are effectively annihilated uh, and they don't actually reappear until well into the Mesozoic. So they, they are as a functional uh, ecosystem no longer in existence for the next uh, maybe 30, 40, 50, 60 million years, right? And that may not be terribly different from what will happen with climate change. We may lose coral reefs as a functional ecosystem. Okay, so this is, I'm going to mark mass extinction events by this dot, dot, dot. Here's one up at the end. And there's actually a number more. So there's a couple, the big one we're going to talk about is the PT event, which is the Permian-Triassic. We haven't gotten there yet. That's going to, that's going to allow us uh, to move from a world dominated by uh, synapsids to diapsids. And then this is the big one we really want to talk about, the move from a world dominated by non-dinosaurs at the end of the Triassic to everything forward um, after that is a world dominated by dinosaur diversity. So we're going to get to these uh, extinction events, and then, of course, this mass extinction event here at the end. So really, what are amphibians? Well, amphibians are really low fin fish that spend a lot of time on the land, and we're going to deal with them. But what we really need to talk about if we're going to deal with dinosaurs is this specific group of amphibians, which are called the amniotes, which is a group of amphibians that have managed to breed away from water. And that's because instead of relying on the water to provide protection for their egg, they bring the ocean with them and have an egg that provides uh, that protection. And uh, all modern groups of terrestrials, vertebrates that are not what we call amphibians, are in fact amniotes uh, to some degree. Uh, or are, are in fact amniotes. It's no coincidence that there is an amniotic sac inside of uh, uh, eggs and that humans also have an amniotic sac, right, when they are uh, developing as a fetus. That's absolutely because you are an amniote. The difference is instead of developing an egg, uh, you don't develop the shell, but you develop all of the rest of the, the portions of the egg, including the yolk sac. Humans actually develop a yolk sac. They just never fill it with yolk sort of in a weird throwback to this ambio development. We're not going to deal with that today. That's going to be for a future talk uh, when we get a chance to do that. Okay, so we've covered a lot of history right here. Like I said, it's relatively fast. We're going to use the rest of our talk on vertebrates to talk about this. And then one that will be the last lecture before we actually get into dinosaurs proper and really talk about dinosaurs because we are really rapidly approaching the period at which vertebrates can produce these very complex forms. 
Okay, and so this is not a dinosaur. It's not that closely related to a dinosaur. This is actually much more closely related to you. The way you can tell that is because it has canines, right? This has evolved some of the characteristics of, amphib of uh, mammals. It's got differentiation within the jaw. It probably maybe had whiskers and hair, um, and it's got a very distinct uh, skull that we're going to talk about, although this one's incredibly emaciated because of that. Uh, but uh, this animal is probably somewhat closely related to us and not closely related to dinosaurs. And this is the group that largely takes over terrestrial environments um, until the end of the Permian.